Ephesians, or are we ever going to get serious? Tonight. I don't know if they planned the ice cream social around when they figured I would get to this part of Ephesians or not. But I'm sure glad you came tonight. I am. All right. The reason why, there's a couple things that I always um, have in trepidation when it comes to uh, subjects to be preached from the Bible. It's not that I'm afraid uh, of what the scripture says. I'm not, certainly not embarrassed by it at all. Um, <clears throat> but in today's world um, of, the, of the American family, I'll say it's an American problem. I, that's what I know the best. And especially in the days that we live in now, it's a, this, this country is in a bad mess. And it's getting worse. Uh, even, you know, even some of the left uh, Democrats out there, uh, it seems like they're kind of drawing a line on all of this woke identity, misgender stuff out there. I don't care what anybody thinks they are. They're, it's not their brain that determines their gender. It's their chromosome. It, and who wrote their chromosome? When they are speaking out against their gender, they are speaking against God. Because God is the one who decides who's male, who's female. I don't know what criteria he uses. I probably wouldn't understand it if I knew it. Because God's ways are not my ways and his thoughts are not my thoughts. As far as the heavens are above the earth, that's how high God's ways are above my ways. So I'd, I wouldn't begin to even try to understand why God chooses a person to be male or female. I just know that he does. And I know that uh, there are certain quarters or certain areas of this country that want that preached and want it taught. And then there's, I would say, more that don't want it spoken of. Because then I am, uh, what do they call it, microaggressions? Which is like little bitty, I'm being very tinily aggressive towards somebody. Huh? It is. If you can't, if you are, if your, if your mental state is hanging at such a dangerous position that if I just say, hi, how are you today, sir? Ah! He misgendered me. If, you, if you're that, yeah, you need something, Okay. I sure hope they find the medicine for you because you're going to need it. But anyway, um, when, I, when dealing with family roles, the role of a husband, the role of the wife, the role of children, uh, in a home, in a marriage, uh, in dealing with that, you, a lot of times you're, gonna, you're always going to find somebody. Um, and, and it does fall on both the man and the woman. The men are not doing their job in following God's biblical role and women are not doing their job in following God's biblical role and I will tell you that God is the one who made our psychology. He's the one that made our brains. He knows how things work. God knows that children, uh, even rebellious ones, there, there, is a, there is a draw to their father and their mother. It's natural that way. Uh, even parents uh, that uh, are just destroying their lives with parties, with uh, various romances and so on. Uh, kids, kids are like dogs in that sense. Dog doesn't care what you do with your life. The dog can be faithful to Charles Manson. And a dog just loved Charles Manson to death, but uh, you know what kind of person he is. And so... Um, we just live in an age right now where biblical roles are stood against at every turn. Come on in. I was just talking about you, so and it's going to get much worse here momentarily. But, no, I'm just teasing. I'm going to tease a lot and make, maybe add some humor to this to sort of break the tension in the room. 
because there's always something that I'm going to say that not everybody's going to like. And it's that way when I, get, when I talk about tithing and, and giving and so on, somebody's inv invariably going to say, oh, that's all them preachers talk about is money. Money, 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 money. Well, if you know me, you know that is the last thing I talk about. Never the first. And uh, I understand that some people just haven't been taught and they need to be taught. And so probably at some point with a lot of our new families and maybe new families that join in with us online that I need to teach biblical tithing because it is biblical. I don't care what some nut on the Internet says uh, that that's in the Old Testament. It's under the law and we're under, there's no place in the New Testament where that and I'm going, you're so crazy. You have no idea what you're talking about. And so, um, you know, that needs to be talked about as well. But definitely our biblical roles uh, in, in a marriage are something that we have to learn. We automatically know how to do the wrong things in life. Amen? Everybody say amen. We are automatically doing the wrong things in life. That much is known. So when the Bible says, when Paul said all scripture is given by inspiration of God, it's and, and profitable. For, for uh, direction, for, I, I'm, missing, I'm messing it up, and I'm, I'm looking right at it probably. Uh, first, no, Second Timothy. Correction, thank you for uh, <clears throat> correcting me. Yeah, uh, let's see here, let me read it. Yeah, what is it, First Timothy, Second Timothy, Second Timothy. 316. That's why I like it so much. It's a 316 verse. Yeah, all script. And verse 15 says that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which is why we still have Sunday school in this church. Some churches have done away with their Sunday school. They were doing it years ago. And I guess they're just trying to be cool or different, just doing it to be different. But a Sunday school definitely is needed because that's, that's where Timothy learned. He learned as a child the Holy Scriptures which is able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so when we, we need to be taught how to, we need to be instructed in righteousness. There are things that are right, there are things that are wrong. What we don't want is a situation where everybody does that which is right in their own eyes. That's what you do not want to live that way. You will not be happy. And again, I, I refer back to Solomon. Solomon did, and God allowed him to have everything that he ever wanted. He had it, and he had it numerous of it. He had it thousands of them. But he wasn't happy. It did not bring him the satisfaction. Um, who was it? Mick Jagger, Rolling Stones. I can't get no satisfaction. He never will either. Okay? He never will. Uh, and unless he gives his life to the Lord, uh, it's, it's not going to change for him. He will never find happiness here. And where he's going, he definitely will not find it there. It's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so, Ephesians. Um, First of all, it tells us in chapter 5, uh, verse, let me get to it here. Um, the, in the verse prior to that, which is what we talked about, uh, not last Sunday, but the Sunday before last, because last Sunday was Mother's Day. Uh, in verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another. Well, that's in verse 21. Okay. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. That's up on the screen. Um, Number one, each one of us are to become servants of the other. Um, a pastor, a bishop of a church, he is not a dictator. He does not stand alone making all the decisions for the church that affect everybody's lives. The Bible all through the scripture speaks of those who are in charge very rarely make all the decisions. They are usually counseled to make decisions. King Ahasuerus, I, was, I just looked at the first verse of the book of Esther last night for some reason. That was up on, the, on my uh, pure Bible search screen. 
And the first verse of Esther talked about Ahasuerus and how he had his kingdom uh, stretched all the way from Egypt all the way over to India. And I think it's the only place in the Bible you're going to find where India is mentioned. But just imagine that. He basically, the Bible says that he was governor over 120 provinces. He was the king over 120 different nations at the time. Now, you think somebody like that can just make all the decisions he wants to, whenever he wants to? No. The, listen, people are known to rebel against bad government. Amen? But they can only take so much of it, and then they say, uh, I'd rather be dead than to live under this guy ever again. And so people willingly give their life because they figured, hey, there's only like, you know, 500 million of us and there's one guy up there. Surely 500 million of us can beat one guy. And uh, so they just, but he had to make decisions that affected all the provinces and he needed counseling. So at first he has Haman counseling, telling him, hey, you know, you got these people called the Jews. And if you read the history, everywhere they go, I mean, they're bad. It sounds like some of the anti-Semites that I hear today who would tell me, Mike, if you ever really studied the Jews in Zionism, you would see what a danger and a threat they are. It's the same thing that Haman told Ahasuerus. That right there tells me that I'm not going to listen to it. Okay, I'm not going to listen to it. And uh, I know, listen, I know what Jews are involved in. I know how evil they can be. But that's the point. God can save them. And if God can save them, he can save anybody. Okay? Amen. So anyway, the same way with those who are in authority, whether it's a man of the house or a, a woman is bringing up her children uh, in a single parent household or a man is bringing up children in a single parent household, uh, they need advice. They need help. They need someone to help counsel them. And what do I do now? And what, sh what should I do with this? And uh, Lisa and I have known for years that all of the major decisions that, that I've made that affect not just me, but my wife, my children, and whatever church I was in, I couldn't make those decisions alone. God had to use her uh, to either go along with the decision or... Uh, to say, I don't know if that's the right thing or not. And usually if I heard that, I would just stop and wait and say, God, you either change her mind or you change my mind, but you're going to show us both what you're going to do. And he's always done that. And so um, that's how it's supposed to be in a godly relationship between husband and wife. He is not the dictator. He is not uh, the macho man that gets his way. And if he doesn't get his way, he's going to punch you out or he's going to slap you around, or he's going to call you all kinds of names, or he's going to threaten the children. Uh, believe it or not, there are guys like that who sit in churches, and, and they honestly believe that that's the role that God has put them in. That their wives are all evil, and God wants them to be submissive to the man, so the man gets to slap them around a little bit and teach them how to behave. That is not biblical. Not biblical. Amen, Pastor Mike. That's good preaching, Mike. You preach that. I'm going to. So we have submission one to another. But then, now he's going he's to dissect it down to your level. And nobody gets out of here unscathed. So, verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands... As unto the Lord. Father, ask for your blessing tonight. Ask for your help. Lord, there are some strong things that have to be said. There are some things, Father, that our flesh, our sinful nature, wants to reject outright and do its own thing. The very nature of our flesh is that it is rebellious to commandments. It is rebellious against the word. It is rebellious against authority. And our flesh is never going to go along with this. But Father, we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk in the spirit. 
so that we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So Lord, teach women, teach men, teach children how to walk in the spirit, in the position that they are in, in the family, in the church, in your kingdom. This is how it's to be. Because Christ, you're the husband. This church and other churches, we're the bride that is awaiting the coming of the bridegroom. And if we live in rebellion against Jesus Christ, it will be because more than likely our wives are living in rebellion, our men are living in rebellion, and our children are living in rebellion. And so, Father, you, you made it known to us that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So, Father, let that not be our religion here. Help us to follow the scriptures, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. The Apostle Paul wrote this by inspiration of God. This is God's word to mankind. It doesn't matter. It, God's word does not uh, bend itself around your particular set of circumstances. It does not uh, submit itself to your whims or your desires or how you see things. It says what it says and it means what it says. I could just simply read this passage, wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And I could stop right here and say, that's the word of the Lord, deal with it. But it's also my responsibility to teach that role uh, in the church and also the men's role. And I, I have said this for a long time. I believe that the husband's role is greater and more difficult than the women's role. And I'll show you why I say that as we move along. So he says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Now, should we, the church, go into rebellion against Christ the husband? Should we say of the word of God, we're not following this, we're not doing this, this is, this, is a, this is a book written by the patriarchal society of evil men who considered women as property. Let me ask you a question. Did you ever read in this Bible that women are property? I never read it. Okay. In fact, turn to Revelation 12. I'll show you that women have the highest of all prizes waiting for them. And the greatest use in the Bible is of the woman. And the Bible says this. The, the husband is over the wife, and yet that husband was under the authority of his mother whom he came from. So just because a, a man child is born, that doesn't mean he can boss his mother around and then boss his wife around. And I'll tell you, any, any teenage boy that is in rebellion to his mother, tells his mother what, that he's not going to do something she told him to do, and he's going to go out and do whatever he wants to do, and she can't tell him what to do. And that, that boy is like that, and he smarts off to his mom and uh, is in rebellion to his mother. I guarantee you he's going to end up about four or five marriages down the road singing who to thunk it. Because no woman is going to put up with that for any length of time. They're not going to do it. Okay, and uh, this is something we've tried to teach our boys and our girls. Um, but it, it happens anyway. All right, so in uh, Revelation chapter 12, look at there. And, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Look at that. Who adorned her with that crown? 
Jesus did. Who, who, who adorned her with the, the clothing of the sun? Jesus did. And notice this, she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And it, oh listen, I don't laugh at it, it makes me angry when liberals now refer to pregnant people. Boy, I get mad at that. Pregnant person. How stupid do you have to be to invent pregnant persons? And then to think that everybody ought to just go along with it, to be as crazy as you are. I don't get it. There appeared another wonder in heaven. We know that. Look at verse 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Look at uh, Galatians, if you would. Galatians chapter 5, I believe it is. Galatians chapter 5. No, Galatians chapter 4. I was close. Um, look at verse... 25, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. And I, I never forget, I never heard any preacher ever preach about heavenly Jerusalem being our mother. I never heard that. I don't know if they were afraid of being called pro-Catholic or what, but there it is in black and white, plain as day. Our, our nativity, our first birth, was from our earthly mothers. But that's corrupt. Our second birth is from heaven itself, which is not corrupt, and it's not corruptible. So she's the mother of us all. And uh, then it says in verse 27, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not. That's Isaiah 54. Break forth and cry thou that travailest not for desolate. Uh, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. I mean, just go through the Old Testament and look at the roles of godly women in there. How God blessed them. How God blessed Sarah being 90 years old and giving birth to her first child ever. And yet that child was a child of promise. It was Isaac. He's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you have Manoah and his wife giving birth to Samson. You have uh, Rachel giving birth to uh, uh, Jacob and Esau. You have, um, oh, let's see here. Who else here? Huh? Hannah, yes, Peninnah is the one having all the babies, but Hannah was the favorite love of the husband. And he loved her so much, and she cried out to the Lord, and God gave her a child. She said, God, if you give me a child, I'll give him to you. She, he, she has a child, she gives it over to God. God blessed her with what, seven more kids? I mean, just look, take an honest look at the roles of women all throughout Scripture. These godly women that were there you'll see how God favored them, how God blessed them, how God used it. God even tells us men to treat them delicately because they're a weaker vessel. That, and I always think of like, I don't know, China from the Ming Dynasty. If you've got a vase, or man, if, if, even if you've got a, a chamber pot from the Ming Dynasty and the King Ming himself... Use that chamber pot. I would treat that like it was, it'd be worth a million dollars. Be delicate. Adorn it. Put it somewhere where everybody could see it and say, that's mine. That's, I believe that's how husbands ought to treat their wives. As somebody to be favored. Somebody that they're not ashamed of or afraid of. Somebody that they hold in high esteem and they don't mind everybody knowing that's my wife. That's my wife. I'll ne this is kind of vain, but I remember Lisa came to visit me while I was at Bible college in Nashville. And her and mom drove out and um, I remember I was showing them around campus and I was, uh, took them up into the library and you had to go up this set of steps to the library and as we were going back down, one of my classmates, um, I remember he was looking at my, at Lisa, she wasn't my wife then, he was just looking at her as she went down the stairs, he was going up the stairs going. 
And I didn't get mad, I went, she's mine. She's mine. Yep, she's mine. I got the pretty one. And I wasn't ashamed at all. And I think that's how it ought to be. All right, now, let's get into this. The husband is the head of wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. And think about that. We're going to learn as we move along through this. There is a reason why the devil went to Eve first. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now that, again, that does not mean that you're a punching bag, that you're to keep your mouth shut, uh, that you have no place in the home and the decisions of the home. It does not mean that. Okay? I want to make that very clear. Now, turn to Genesis. I, and God showed me this the other day. As some of you know, I have had to deal with on about four different occasions. And some I won't talk about. But four different occasions that I can remember just off the top of my head where I've had to deal with the issue of a couple living together as if they were married, but they were not legally married. I got asked by a couple several years ago. They lived out in California and they said, would you be willing to, if we came to your church, would you be willing to join me and my wife together in marriage? And I said, sure, I would. If I, if I preach for marriage, I should be for marrying people. And uh, they said, now, you know, we're out in California, and this is back before uh, Obama. But they lived out there, and they said, now, California has has dirtied marriage so bad because now they're, they're going along with gay marriages and so on. They said, we just don't feel like we should, we should get a marriage license. Would you marry us without one? And I said, nope, I won't do it. And they wanted to know why. So I began to explain to them uh, all of the problems that will arise with them not having a legal marriage. Number one is that if they have an off-the-records marriage, then they can have an off-the-records what? Divorce. Off-the-record divorce. That means the guy can say to the woman, get out of my house. Pack your bags, you leave my stuff here. And, and in preparation for that, he's shut down all the bank accounts so she can't have any money. He can put her out and she has nothing to go on. That's not right. Number two, she could do the same thing to him. She could, while he's at work, be piling money into her private account because she's on the account. She can be pulling money out of their joint account, put it all under her name. He ain't got a leg to stand on. He's going to have to go through, I don't know how many courts hearings and pay lawyers and all this stuff and still will not be guaranteed that he's going to get anything of his back. But that's what they wanted. One couple, I know for a fact, this man wanted an off the books marriage because, and he told me this. He said, if I have to, if I have to leave her, I don't want her ended up with all my stuff like my previous two wives did. He made the mistake of telling me that. And I told him, I said, so you're going to straight there and tell me how much you love her and yet you will not make an honest woman out of her. You will not get an, a marriage certificate. And he said, I'm not going to. You can talk all you want to. He said, I'm not getting one. And finally, we parted company. And, uh, but he told me that's what he wanted was in case it went south and he told me some things about her that I kind of suspected. He said, uh, I, I don't want to get stuck with her owning all my stuff. He said, I want to be able to keep my farm and keep this and keep that. And I, and I told him to his face, I said, don't tell me you love her. You love your stuff is what you love. But you don't love her. 
And uh, I didn't pull any punches with him. And I'm just glad he didn't punch back. Amen. But that's the first problem. Second problem is, when you go to fill out important papers, legal documents, that are asking the question, are you married to this person? If you say no, because you're not legally married, then what does that say to you and your spouse because you are believing your mind that you are married, but you're putting down on papers that you're not married or the reverse. You're putting down on paper that you are married, but you can't prove that you're married. There's no paperwork. There's no license. There's nothing. Anybody that knows anything about tax law knows that the IRS treats married couples differently than unmarried couples. Treats them differently. That's why on your tax form, you're, you're filing married, filing jointly, married, filing separately, or single. But I don't know what, how it handles single, but living with someone you think you say you're married, but the IRS would say, if you ever audited, where's your marriage license? And if you don't have a marriage license to show them, you know what you just committed? Fraud. Listen, you don't want to fraud the IRS. You shaking your head like you know, Melissa. Yeah, it's the Lord. The Lord changed you. Amen. I get that. Okay. I'm not going to bring it up again. Now, here's another thing that God showed me about a month ago. And I, I went, well, that makes all the sense in the world. Okay. Let's say that I'm going to pick on Chris and Helen. You guys are married, right? Why is he laughing and you're not? It's papyrus. It's <laughs> written on papyrus. But let's say, let's say that you two didn't get a marriage license. And, and, it, and you made this excuse. Oh, it's the government. And I've had people say, I just don't think the government should have a right to tell people who they can and cannot marry. Let me tell you something. Marriage license. They don't care. You go to the marriage op license office in Hillsboro. They don't care. Who else, whose names go on there. They just need to know if you are who you say you are. Show us your driver's license. Show us your birth certificate. Fill out the paper. Give us the money. And then go have somebody do the wedding that's duly licensed to do the wedding. We don't care who you marry. They don't tell you that, but I've had people use that as an excuse. And I just ask for somebody to produce any evidence that the license office in their county refused to join two people because they said so. It doesn't happen that way. But, so they don't want to get a marriage license. They didn't get a marriage license. So, Chris, what is your last name? Mangan. Helen, what was your maiden name? Weiss. Weiss? German. Yeah, oh, my, yeah, Mangan and, yeah, oh, my goodness. Well, you Germans belong together, all right? Why do we call it a maiden name? Why do we refer to their name as a maiden name? Huh? A maiden is an unmarried young lady. So your maiden name was vice. It was given to you by your parents. 50 years now after you say you got married, but you didn't get a marriage license. What is your last name still? Legally, wise. Does that matter? Look up here. This is the book of the generations of who? Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. 
Why is it to this day, in most cultures of the earth, the lady takes the husband's name? Right there. So, you're not married, even in God's eyes, according to Scripture, you're not married. If you still have legally your maiden name as your last name, you can fool yourself, you can fool the people around you, but God knows that you're not married, you didn't change your name. And listen, getting married, and ladies, and changing your last name to his last name is a whole lot easier than you applying for a legal name change. You got to go through lots of hoops to get the Social Security office to legally change your name to something else. Whereas when you're married, there's a very simple thing. You fill out, send it in, and it's done. The day you're married, you can start signing checks. Mrs. Helen Mangan. Lisa, I remember, I was, I was getting tickled at Lisa because she was going, Lisa Lit <clears throat> Hoggard. It was kind of funny back then. But I can't believe I didn't see that until just recently. I know that, that makes all the sense in the world. That is God saying right there, if your name's is still the same as a maiden, guess what you are in God's eyes? A maiden. You're Eve, but you're not Adam. Now, think about it. What do we call ourselves now as this church? What's our title? What's our religion? Christians, we took our Savior's name. Even before we joined him, we're, we're, we are married by default because we are, uh, what's that word? Boy, I'm having trouble with words today. Espoused. We are, we are espoused to Christ, and that was legally binding. Joseph was espoused to Mary. They were as good as married. They just hadn't consummated the marriage yet. And the Holy Ghost had to tell Joseph, or the angel of the Lord told him, said, Joseph, don't worry about it. Okay? You're, everybody knows you two are together. Just go on like you're married, and everything will be fine. Okay? But they were already espoused, meaning that it was just a matter of a little ceremony and the uh, honeymoon night, and that was it. And uh, so we know that that happened after, of course, Jesus was born. But God called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And it's the same way. A, a new family, a new body is created in the day when the husband and the wife join together for the very first time. A new person is joined because they are one flesh and they are created on that day, Mr. and Mrs. Adam. And uh, John, I only wish I would have had that when I first talked to you about it. Yeah, because that would have sensed it right there, okay? I mean, it just makes sense to me now. If you don't, if you're still got your maiden name, don't tell me you're married. Because you're not. There's no way you can justify it uh, by holding on and retaining that, that last name. Anyway, now turn to 1 Corinthians 7. <clears throat> Isn't God smart? God's waste... Listen, God is way wiser than our ability to try to deceive everybody. Amen. We try to trick and fool people, but God always seems to catch us, doesn't he? That means he's smarter than... Uh, do what? Oh. Smarter than everybody. I like you. All right, 1 Corinthians 7. Now watch this. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, there's, there's a discussion about this part of the verse. Was Paul quoting from the letter that the church sent him? Because he says, you wrote unto me some things and I'm going to address them. And then he says, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. There are some people who think, that Paul was quoting from their letter because they were asking, we think it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, they may have meant by that that even marriage, now that they're Christians, even marriage would be a no-no because of the marital act. 
And so they, it, it looks like they were writing to Paul explaining the good doctrine that they come up with. We decided that it's not good for men to touch women even if they're married to them. So we've ordered all the married couples to be split up. By the way, that's what David Koresh did. He ordered, uh, if you came and joined his cult being married, then um, you had to split for your wife and you could not be with her at all. David could. In fact, he said, I've undertaken the burden that all these 13-year-old girls here, I've undertaken. You know what he was doing? He believed that his seed was the godly seed that would be accepted and that he, it was his job alone to procreate the children. This is why they, that Koresh would not let a lot of the children out of the compound was because they were his children. And he knew that if they would let them out, they would do DNA on them and he would be caught in it. Because Texas law allowed him to marry a 14-year-old girl with parents' permission. But you just couldn't be married to two or three or four 14-year-old girls. So he knew he was going to prison forever if he ever walked out of that compound. And he knew that they would find out whose kids those were. And those are the ones that got burned up in that fire. That man was pure evil. But so was Janet Reno. She's the one that ordered the hit. Makes me mad. But anyway, so it looks like they may have been saying, we've separated every, all the men and the women, and that's how it's to be. Uh, I actually got to go into an old New England church. Back years ago, uh, when I was in college, it was in New Durham, New Hampshire. It's where the first Free Will Baptist Church ever was, and uh, was was pastored by the name by uh, Benjamin Randall was his name. And you walk in that church, and it's really it's really neat. It's built in that old English New England style of building, and they had pews down the side, pews down the side, and in the middle they had a set of pews coming down the middle, but there was a wooden barrier going all the way back to the back of the church. The men sat over here and the women sat over here. And it was the idea that the, the women had to remain silent and so they were not allowed to say anything, amen, or anything like that. And any of the comments or whatever would come from this side of the church. So that if you were married, your wife had to come sit over here and you as a man got to sit over here. That's the way, that's the way they did it back then. So it's possible that the Corinthian church, again, doing the wrong thing, because the Corinthian church, that's all they did was the wrong thing. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. But look at what Paul said in verse 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication. So what are you doing? You think that you split this married couple up. They've been married for five years. This is the life that they've learned how to live. Now you're going to separate them from that and think that everything's going to be okay? It's not. He said, you're setting, you're, you're setting these people up for fornication. So to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. And let every woman have her own husband. See that, ladies? You get your own husband. Look at verse 3. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. And likewise also the wife unto the husband. In this verse... Paul is calling that benevolence. In other words, let the husband render unto the wife, let the wife render unto the husband. Why? To avoid fornication. And I think it's, I think it, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get off scripture here and say, just kind of say something that I think and it may be wrong. But since the women's liberation movement and the way most girls are brought up now and they're told that you don't let any man be your boss, you don't let any man tell you what to do, you don't let any man use you for this, use you for that. So is it possible, and I'm not saying it's all the women's fault, but is it possible that the women's liberation mindset in the minds of grown women now 
who do not believe that they should render to their husband due benevolence, is it possible that that has driven their husbands into porn and then into fornication and adultery? Is it possible? Um, and it would work both ways. Guys, if you don't take care of your wife, somebody else is going to. Because I guarantee you, especially if she works in an environment where there's men, somebody's going to hit on her. Somebody's going to. And um, if you have a strong marriage, she'll just take one look at that guy and say, would you get away from me? You stink. Every time I get around you, you stink. Get away from me. Amen, women? You beat these wolves to death. Amen? Get them away. So God definitely is saying here, take care of your wife, take care of your husband. Okay? And if you do it in love, you won't complain about how you think you're being used. Either one of you. Uh, verse 4, now look at this. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. So how does the pro-abortion stance jive with that? The woman says, this is my body. No. That thing inside of you does not share your DNA. It has its own unique gene sequence. As soon as it's born, you will see that its DNA does not match yours. If, you, if there was a murder committed and the husband got killed, would the police look at the wife and the child, grown child, and say, one of them two did it, but we have a problem. They both share the exact same DNA. So that never happens. They have two different DNA sequences. So the wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. Deal with it. Deal with it. This is what God said to do. And again, where love abides, Christ's love, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. If love abides there, I don't have a problem with my wife saying to me, you need to start wearing colored shirts. Because I would wear white shirts. I ordered some shirts, Oxford shirts last night, and I got one white shirt and three colored shirts, just for my wife. That's how she likes me to look. So I make her happy. Um, and likewise, the other way. Defraud ye not one the other except it be with consent for a time that you may get now notice this the word defraud here is used in the context of withholding from your spouse defraud you not the one not one the other except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that satan tempt you not for your incontinency and what does incontinency mean you can't refrain you cannot refrain. Um, the man that followed me uh, turned to... Um, well, where was I going here? Oh, um, I can't remember what scripture I was going to. I'll think of it in a minute. The man that followed me in down at Richwoods, when I resigned Richwoods Church and came here, uh, the, the man that followed me in over there, he was married. I, I knew them both from Bible college in Nashville. And uh, we got to be friends out there. And then when he took that church, uh, we became friends again. My, I introduced my wife to them. And, and you know, we did things together. His wife worked here at the school for a little while and so on. Um, but his wife started having relations with other women in the community. And um, that took me by surprise. It took him by surprise. He did everything he could to try to save his marriage, but she was just bent on staying with women. And she would just go from woman to woman in that, in that area, and everybody knew what was going on. Everybody knew what was going on before he found out. And I'm sorry to say that I knew it before he found out, but his wife told me that she told him. So I didn't say anything. I didn't want to embarrass him. I didn't say anything. Well, she divorced him. 
And the church that he was at, they told him, uh, when you came here, brother, we voted for you to be the pastor, not your wife. So as far as we're concerned, she divorces you, you still be our pastor. And they were content with that. But the denomination stepped in and said, ah, ah, no, 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 no. We got a rule that says you can't be divorced. So he had to leave. And he said, Mike, he came talk to me one time. He said, Mike, he said, I'm, I'm too young to be celibate. That was, he knew that he could not contain his vessel. And he needed a wife. So he, and he found a good one too. I mean, God blessed him with a good wife. She was top notch. And I was so glad to see that. But he did the right thing. He did all the right things in that. And the denomination told him no. So he went to another denomination. He's pastoring now, doing a good job. I'm tickled to death. Okay. Uh, boy, I wish I could. Oh, uh, Exodus 19. Turn there. There was, a, there was a situation that arose in the wilderness where the men were told not to be with their wives. So we look in Exodus 19. Uh, let's see here. Where? Ah, but here I found it. Verse 14. This is, now this came from God earlier in the passage. Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people and they washed their clothes. Now they're, they're going to go see God in three days. And he said unto the people, be ready against the third day, come not at your wives. So God told Moses to tell the Israelites, separate husband and wife for three days. Surely you can go three days. So they separated the one from another the wives and the husbands, they separated. It was just as much for the wives as it was the husbands because God wanted them clean. He wanted them pure. He wanted them right. They, they, they had to spend time in prayer and fasting, dedicating themselves to God because they're fixing to meet God face to face at Mount Sinai. And I promise you, when you get ready to meet God, you're going to want to be clean. So God instructed them to do that, and they did, because we don't have any knowledge, we don't have anything in the text that says that somebody didn't do it, and they had to be killed, because I'm sure that that's what would have happened. And so here, back in 1 Corinthians, defraud you not the one another, except it be for consent, with consent for a time. So the husband might say, uh, hon, look, I've got, man, I've got something on my mind, on my heart, it's really eating at me, and... I think I just need to spend some time in prayer and fasting. By the way, three days was what I spent here, and God gave us this. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying that I, I just now made that connection there. Uh, but I just, I did. I separated from everybody. I didn't really have anything to do with the teachers or the students or anything like that. I got alone, and uh, I'm glad God, I'm glad it paid off. But there is a, a time when that is called for, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempts you not for your incontinency. And there's the key right there. If you withhold from one another, you're not, especially with young bodies, you're not meant, it is not meant for you to be celibate. It's not possible. Paul was an exception to the rule. Paul said, I would that you were as me. Paul didn't need a wife. We have no record of Paul even thinking about a woman or anything like that. That was a gift that God gave him that, so that Paul could be 100% dedicated to the Lord and not have to lead about a wife and children, not have to raise a family. He was dedicated to the Lord 100% of the time. But that was Paul. That's not us. What, and so what does the Bible, how does the Bible qualify me to be a bishop well it says in the text i have to be the husband of a wife why does god say that so that i'm not out on friday nights looking for some chick in the bar i know a preacher that did that he got caught he was meeting he was coming all the way from cuba missouri to downtown st louis to meet women on the riverfront down here and uh bob tebow found out about it about it and he confronted him at that bar 
because he was still pastoring a church and meeting women at the bar and Tebow showed up. Yeah, well, he knew where he was going to be. He was told where he was going to be. He wasn't in there buying the guy a beer. Okay? That may, let, me, let me make that very clear. Okay? Uh, he was told that that's where he was going to be, and he went to confront him about it. And uh, he said, you need to either get right with God or get out of our denomination. You're not going to do this. And so he resigned his post, and that was it. All right?